Nicholas Pelleggi. He has chronicled the world of mobsters, teamsters, and wise guides, uncovering stories that seem made for a film. He received an Academy Award nomination for his collaboration with Martin Scorsese on Goodfellas, the screen version of his book, Wise Guy. Casino, Love and Honor in Las Vegas is his latest book. It is a story of the love triangle that led to the demise of six mob bosses and the end of an era in Las Vegas. He has again collaborated with Scorsese, and in an unusual move, the book and film versions are coming out almost simultaneously. The film starring Robert De Niro and Sharon Stone and Joe Pesci will be released November 22nd. The book is already out, and I am pleased to have Nicholas Pelleggi here this time. Welcome. Thank Great you. to have you here, Nick. Uh, what, where did this, I want to talk about you first. Let me just talk about you, this whole interest you have in the mob. Uh, you grew up in Bensonhurst. Yes. Uh, some mobsters out there. Indeed. Uh, you went on to become a police reporter. Yes. Uh, you and Gay Talese, you, you two share what? We're cousins. We're cousins. Yes. I mean, Gay is from Ocean City, New Jersey, yeah. far away it's, from And his father was a tailor in, yes. in Ocean City, New Jersey. Uh, and, and what was this fascination, though, with the mob for you and this interest in curiosity? Well, I think I was fascinated by these people. Um, I saw that world growing up. You know, yeah, you didn't know about it. When I was a kid, of course, there was no such thing as organized crime. You remember the FBI said there is no, no such right, thing right. as organized crime. And yet I, I would look out the window much <laughs> the way the kid and wise guy looked out yeah. the window. And uh, you'd see these guys in aluminum suits and shiny shoes with all this money and big Cadillacs, and they never worked. Yeah. You know, they, were always, they, they were always walking around during the day. It's an amazing thing. They flipped quarters, and you wondered, <laughs> who are these? Everyone else in the neighborhood went to work very early in the morning and came home late at night, and they were beat, yeah, like exactly. my father, hardworking people. And uh, so the fascination is clear. Uh, they also seem to be the men in the neighborhood with an enormous amount of power. Uh, you know, you couldn't park. Uh, or double park on most streets, except in front of their social clubs, they were always double parked, and nobody bothered them. They could pop, park in front of a fire hydrant, and no one bothered them. The cops would wave as they yeah. drove by. And it's, it, it, it's not confounding that I would have been fascinated by them, and I was, and lots yeah. of people have. There's been. a touch in, in the, in the uh, Robert De Niro movie, uh, Bronx Tale, in yes. what you say, that whole sense of, of what yeah. the well, mob and guy means. And, yeah, and Main Street. And, and the Marty's... Uh, 1972 film, Mean Streets. It's there. You see the power of this tiny... It's, you know, by the way, it's just a tiny little population bunch. Back in 65 with the Valachi hearings, when they finally revealed that <laughs> this yeah. thing actually existed, there were, uh, I think, 4,500 names of these Italian-Americans yeah. who were members of organized crime. That's against 19 or 20 million Italian-Americans. Since so, the Rico statute and all of that, are, are they declining in influence oh, yeah. and power? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The... the we want to use the word the golden age. The golden age is over. I mean, it's tarnished um, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, most specifically, I think the Justice Department, the FBI, have done an extraordinary job. Um, they've uh, the organized broke, crime strike yes. force. Oh, the organized crime strike force did a terrific job. They specialized. They concentrated. Uh, the uh, Congress passed uh, uh, Title Threes, which allowed easier um, uh, access to, to wiretap information. The RICO statutes went through. Uh, written yeah. by Do uh, Professor Blakey at Notre Dame. Robert Blakey, yeah. Yes, right. and they, they really, all of these, all of these factors uh, were tremendous uh, contribution to the business of it. And, and also, the exposure in the media. Finally, people began to talk. Remember, you, you've got to remember that Joe Valachi in uh, 1963, when Peter Moss book, right. the Valachi Papers, he was the first mobster to talk and say from 1900, in yeah. 65 years. Since Valachi to now, there are 5,000 guys in the Federal Witness Program. So you can see the dissolution of the apparatus right there. And it also seems that the people, the young people are coming up. I mean, you think of what, uh, they just don't seem to have it. No, they're not the same guys. Not the same guys. No, no, no. The, you're talking about immigrants, uh, really hard scrabble people with not very many opportunities. You're talking about really smart guys who could never go beyond themselves. And when you go back to people like Meyer Lansky and, and Frank Costello, yeah. and they were smart and as very, well as tough. Very, very smart and, and very sophisticated tough. about business. Yes, yes. Too. yes. And yeah. they were, you know, if they could avoid thuggery, they would never have been thugs, I don't think. Uh, but it was their A only way. way of getting into the middle class and then into the upper income yeah. levels. Did most did of them hope that their kids wouldn't go into the business? I think almost all of them hope their kids don't go into the business. And almost all of their kids don't go into the business. Yeah. Uh, most of them uh, 
have sons who become dentists and doctors and accountants. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. And then their grandchildren come along. And so you write Wise Guys, on. and yes. that becomes Goodfellas, and it's a yes. huge success, and everybody likes the movie. And you got to know Henry Hill like... Well, I wrote the book about Henry Hill, yeah, yes, right. so we so spent a few years together. And you learned about that level yes. of street yes. guy. It was the working level. It was the street level guy. The guy from Queens who hijacked trucks. And were they fascinating with you because you knew the police? I mean, because you had been a police reporter and you understood that end of it? I don't think they're fascinated by journalists at all. I mean, these guys don't read books. I don't think Henry ever read the book. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, I kept waiting for Henry to say, uh, oh, I read the book and I liked it or I didn't like it. And I said, did you ever read my book? Finally. He says, well, I said, no, tell me the truth. No. no. So what do you mean you didn't read it? Well, I got to read it for you. He said, I told you everything that's in it. Yeah. You see, and that's the attitude. I once interviewed Charles Manson. Oh, God. You know, and he said, came out and he said, I've been watching you. you know, <laughs> that's and, a scary thing. I know. And, 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 and he comes around the table to shake hands. And they told me once that, the, the, you know, these guards had said, and then at the end of the interview, I said to him, are you going to, because he said, I've been watching you I mean, on television. I said, are you going to watch this? He said, no, I just did it. <laughs> you know, it was like, I told you the story, so I'm not going to watch Isn't myself on television kind of telling mentality. you the story. Well, yeah. well. Casino, the idea came from the great Michael Corder. The great he is. <laughs> yeah. he, he was the one who thought of it. Um, uh, and uh, it was after we did Wise Guy. And, um, you know, as I said, Wise Guy is sort of low. The editor of Simon & Schuster. He is the editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster. said what? There's a fascination with casinos and the mob and, and how the casinos he was said, an attraction. He said, let's move it up. Yeah. We've done Wise Guy. We've done, you know, there's a lot of books about mobsters. But let's move it up. He said, Las Vegas is the city the mob built. It's their paradise. And if we take a look at Las Vegas, maybe we can see the very tip top of that world and what that world is like for them. And what did Excellent you do? Excellent idea. I thought it was a brilliant idea. I said, I'd love to do it. Let's do it. And we did. <laughs> Everybody needs a Michael Corner, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so then you did what? Well, the first thing I did is now I needed a story. Yeah. I mean, you just can't do a nonfiction work about you know, statistics of the growth of the gaming industry. Uh, and I went out to Vegas and started asking questions and started poking into it and found that in 1983 there was a day when the mob's power to control casinos ended with a conviction of six mob bosses. Uh, and uh, I then began to track back from then. I went to Kansas City where the trial took place, got all of the court records, all of the documents, began putting it into a chronology. It took about three years, three and a half years. At the end of three and a half years, I had the story. Um, I had an 850-page chronology, single space. And what was the story that's and in And the here? story was that the mob's influence with the Teamsters Pension Fund had come to an end as a result of a love triangle between three people. Before we say that, the mob came to Las Vegas and were able to do things because Jimmy Hoffa, who built up this enormous pension fund, right. and it was run by some corrupt lawyers, some corrupt lawyers out there, and they used this to funnel money to organized crime, and they used that money to it take was, over casinos. It was fabulous. What they did is they controlled the Teamsters pension fund. Right. It's simple as that. And they controlled it because they controlled the men on the trust. And we're they, talking about billions of dollars, We're right? talking about, at the time it started, it was a $4 billion yeah, pension right. fund. Billion. You know, right. And you're talking the 60s and 70s, right. $4 billion. Right. It's a staggering amount. Right. Uh, by the way, just to be honest about it, I don't believe the Teamsters Pension Fund lost a nickel on any one of those loans. That was not the problem. They made money on those loans. They were great loans right. from that point of view. The problem was if you wanted to get one of those loans, you had to go through a wise guy to get it. Now, you didn't go through a mob. You didn't go to see Marlon Brando and The Godfather. You went to lawyers and insurance brokers, and there were a couple of people who were key operatives in it. Yeah. One of them was a man by the name of Alan Dorfman. Right. It was sort of a middleman in all of this. And you wouldn't get that loan unless one of those guys said okay. And in return for saying okay, what they would ask would be, uh, you know, Charlie, we, you know, we're giving you a lot of money when you're buying these casinos, and we're giving you $62 million. You've got to do one thing for us. We want to make sure our money is safe. Certainly, says Charlie. We want to make sure we have a guy in the treasurer's office, and we want to make sure we have the people in the count room, which is where you count all the money. Yeah. And of course, I mean, the difference between you getting the loan and not getting the loan is those two little jobs. You know, it's a mop job to him. So why not? Give it to him. And they get their men into the count room, and the next thing that happens is they They're siphon. They're saving $15 million a year yeah. right off the top. Right, yeah. right off the top. Now, what happened to Dorfman? Dorfman? <laughs> Dorfman was murdered. That's what I thought. Yes. Uh, now, it all ended 
with the indictment and conviction of these six guys. Yes. And it ended because there was a love triangle. Yes. One of the reasons, but, but yeah. a major one Who were one the was three that? characters in the love triangle? Well, the three characters in the love triangle were uh, 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 one of the men was a man by the name of Frank Rosenthal, who was a, a professional gambler and a handicapper and brilliant, just a brilliant handicapper. Who'd come from Chicago. He was from Chicago originally, and then he went through Las Vegas, uh, through Florida, and then he went to Las Vegas and, and decided to give, got married to a beautiful, beautiful showgirl. Uh, and wanted to have a family. He had, you know, he'd lived a knock around life. Uh, but he's not a, you know, we're not talking about a gangster. We're talking about a professional, fabulous gambler. Yeah. And uh, so he got married. And he, his wife said, you know, what are, what are you doing doing this handicapping? It's such a time. Why don't you go to work in a casino? And he did. He went and got a job in a casino. And he was brilliant at it and went right up to the top. Yeah. The other person in it was a gangster by the name of Tony Spilatro. Turned out he was a boyhood friend of Frank Rosenthal's. And when he got to Vegas, Frank Rosenthal's stomach must have turned because he knew, oh, trouble. you know, trouble is here. And indeed, Frank was right. Trouble was there. Uh, Spolatro got to Vegas and could have made a decent life for himself, but couldn't resist being the gangster and attracted attention, created problems, uh, started doing, started a stick-up gang. It was the most bizarre kinds of behavior. And as a result, became estranged from his old pal Rosenthal, who didn't want anything to do with him. He was trying to go as legit as he could. Oh, yes, because he was legit. Right. And, uh, but Spalaccio, in a sense, kept dragging him into all sorts of horrible situations, just from the exposure. And in the end, Spalaccio was so furious with Rosenthal that I think uh, he, to get even, he had an affair with Rosenthal's wife, who was also having and a Rosenthal drinking. Rosenthal had his own affair, too. Well, they were, at that right. point, it, the marriage was pretty bad. Yeah. And, uh, but that relationship between Tony and Frank Rosenthal's wife was seen by the FBI. And that's what started the business, because the FBI had pictures, and somehow those pictures got to the press in Chicago and in Kansas City and various cities where some important people saw them. And then there was all hell to pay. And, the, uh, and slowly the FBI began getting more wires, and within, uh, by 1979, 1980, it was ready to topple the movie that Marty's making. Rosenthal, Frank Rosenthal is played by Robert De Niro. Well, a very so character, yes, yes, right. yes by, character. by De Niro, yes. Joe Pesci plays the Tony the Ant character. Spil the Spilatro character, basically. And the yes. wife, Jerry, is played by Sharon Stone. Yes. All right. That's the movie. We'll talk about that. So you write this story. Yes. You get to know Rosenthal. Yes. After how many years trying to get him to talk? <laughs> about three. <laughs> and what would you do? Just call him up? Oh, I would call him. him. I would talk to his lawyer. Whenever he had to appear at hearings of various kinds, I would get on an airplane and go to visit him. Uh, at the hearing, he would see me. I would nod. And we would sometimes go back to his lawyer's office, and he'd say, you're still around? You know, what am I going to talk to you for? I'm not going to talk to you. And, uh, you know, this is a man who uh, had been through a lot. Did one day he decide to talk? Yes. I think at one point, uh, when I had all of this material, I told him, look, I've got it all. This is going to be a book whether you I'm talk to me or not. I'm going to do it whether you do it or not. Yes, and I'd like to do it right, because there's a lot of stuff that has been printed about you and people have told me that I know is wrong. So let's just get it right, so at least the wrong stuff isn't wrong. Yeah. And he agreed to that, and then we started talking, and I think we got on pretty well, and I, I was uh, quite impressed with him, very impressed with him. So you write the book Casino, and while it's in some form, the phone rings over at your house, and either yeah. you or Nora pick up the phone, no. and what's the conversation? Well, at a certain point, now, mind you, Marty and I are friends, and so right. he knew I was working on this right. casino project, and we had planned to do it as a film, because he had been, I'd kept him apprised of everything right. in it. Uh, and, you know, I would call him up with, you won't believe what I found out yesterday. It's one of those <laughs> right, calls, right? right. And uh, he was going to direct Clockers, if you remember. Right. And then he decided not to direct Clockers. Spike Lee was going to direct it, and Marty would produce it. And it left what they call in the industry a window for Marty. Yeah, Marty right. suddenly didn't have anything to direct. Yeah, if Marty has a window, oh, you better jump through it because <laughs> you're going to have an army of people jumping through it in a Who second. Who want him. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. God. You know, there's no, no and he question. was perfect for you to direct this film. You wanted him to direct oh, that I, film. I mean, I, the, one of the reasons why I was doing it was that eventually I was hoping the book would be good enough that he yeah. would be able to do it. We would do it as a movie. Then do you write with an idea that this is a book that will be made into a movie? No. I mean, does, no, does you the, can't, what you, you can't do, do it in, at all? No, you can't do it. You can't do that. You you're just do it as a book. Scenes, you're thinking of how to no, write yeah. an interesting no, this, book. The, you know, if, and if you can write an interesting book and if you can get the real because I'm a nonfiction writer, I don't write yeah. fiction, right. so I can only put in what actually happened. Uh, 
But once but you've you can got write it, it with a style that just—I well, mean, well, that's what they say about Michael Crichton, you know. Yes, I mean, and yes. He, he writes fiction, but yeah. they say it's written with an idea. Yeah, well, it could that be. This is a film. It could be, but I've always, even back at New York Magazine, I always tried to write visually. Yeah. I always try to, you try to open a magazine piece with a scene. Yeah. You set a scene, set a scene. because. Because, you know, you're not competing with the written word. You're competing with television. You're competing with the Maltese Falcon. You're competing yeah. with really important things <laughs> yeah. that people right. could be better occupying their time with. So you'd better, you'd better be there for that. So Marty calls up and he says, uh, look, i got a window. Yes. I've, I've gotten Spike Lee to do clockers. Right. And, and I don't have to do that. Right. And so all of a sudden the time schedule is parallel now rather than. Yes. And you're going to write the screenplay. Yeah, so we sit down and we write the screenplay. I had, again, I had the 800 pages yeah. of chronology and basic outline, and we had hundreds of pages of interviews. So all of that stuff got delivered to Marty's house. And Marty, of course, went, took a bath in that material for about three weeks. And, and you came out of it with all of this stuff. I mean, he then read all of the basic material. It wasn't a matter of Marty just reading a 360-page book. Marty had the original material to read. You see, the original wiretaps. And what's it like to work with him? I mean, when you're in a hotel room and the two of you are sort of working out this thing, mm -hmm. what's it like? It's great. <laughs> well, he's great. I mean, he's a friend and he's funny and we have a good time and we know where we're going with it. But he sees the totality of oh, the whole the thing. Difference. That's the difference. Yes, he does. He does. Uh, when we'd get that, when I'd get the first outline, this very <laughs> sketchy outline yeah. that we got back. Now, I would type it up and then he'd have a copy and I'd have a copy. We'd both work and we'd both make notes. And I'm making kind of FBI <laughs> reporter notes. And then I'd get his copy and I'd look at his copy and he had, he'd have little drawings along the margin. I mean, you're talking about an original opening outline brief. And he's got drawings and then there's little things he's got. Uh, uh, a land of the rising sun, animals. I said, what is that? Because I, hey, well, that's a musical piece. And of course, that's the way the movie ends. He yeah. already, he hears he the, music. the music. He hears it. He hears it. He, see, he writes it and he sees it as a movie. It's in his head. It's just, he's got a projector up there. And but, that's what he does. It's great. And so you do, do you two write it together? Yes, we sit in the room and we, we go through it scene by scene by scene. And then we have dialogue, which is terrific because we each start going back and forth with the dialogue. And he takes the line and he'll read and he'll do it. And then I'll do it. And we bounce it back and forth. And you're almost, I hate to use the word playing parts, but you've got it. And then also, as we're going, and we get to a point where we're not sure. And we're sure, what happened? What really happened? What? Because we always go to the truth. And then right from there, I might have called Frank Rosenthal. I would call Frank Collada. I'd call people who are my original sources, call FBI guys. Right and say, from, and say from, what happened? Yeah, what actually happened at this yeah. point? And then they would tell us, and quite often, the stuff they told us, we could have never made up. You just can't make it up. The real stuff is so bizarre. And, it's, and that's the way we did it. And, and the characters that you chose, was De Niro always the first choice? Was Pesci the always, I mean, I, or, or were some people unavailable? Or I don't know. That's, you that's know, his game. Yeah, Marty, Marty, I think we pretty much knew, I knew Marty De Niro his guys. To, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, these yeah. are his guys. And, I mean, Marty has a kind of repertory company. I mean, Frank Vincent, who plays the Frank Marino part in the movie. I, mean, I remember seeing him. Frank Marino is the lawyer, isn't he? Uh, no, Frank uh. Marino is um, is the, the Joe Pesci's pal, ah. the guy with the graying right. hair. Well, right. he he, if you remember, he's in Raging Bull. Yeah. He's in Goodfellas. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's a wonderful, and he's wonderful in this. Wonderful. Has Rosenthal read the book? Yes. And what does he say? Well, Rosen, uh, Frank is, um, uh, it's a tough book for him to read, and it's, tough, it's a tough subject. It brings up a lot of very tough memories. He was, I feel, very brave in going through it with me. I mean, he did it, he wrote, he helped me to the degree that he wanted to make sure it was correct. Uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't get anything from me doing the book. I mean, he was not like Henry Hill, indeed, had been paid by Simon & Schuster. Frank Rosenthal didn't want money, nor do I think he needs the money. He just... He wanted it correct. He wanted it right. And uh, well, how does I think he feel we about Robert right. De Niro playing him in a movie. That's not hard to take. <laughs> 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 when uh, it turned out that it was going to be a movie, I hadn't mentioned it to I. You, you didn't know. use that to sell no. him on the idea. No, uh, because you never know. Yeah. You know what would happen if Bob wasn't able to do it, and something else came up, or Marty was, you know, the window suddenly closed, and you know the. Yeah. You never know in that business. So you don't you want know. to be out on that limb. And no, and I don't want to have the guy promising. To, but it wasn't. He called me. I, I was in an airport in Fresno talking to somebody who also knew of the business. And he, uh, it was Rosenthal who called me and said he had heard that Bob De Niro was going to play it, play the Frank character. And I said, yep, I've heard the same thing. 
And he said, well, he said, I want you to know that I think Robert De Niro is the greatest actor of his generation. I said, I couldn't so agree I. more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then they, they, um, they worked together quite a bit. This story that's captured in this book and on film, this true story with some alterations. I mean, Minor some alterations. I mean, the, you know, the alterations are the Hollywood telescoping sort of, and... Yeah, you know. right, right. Some you can't have all the characters, no, et cetera, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. It's what? It's a story of the dream of a... What is it? How do it's you It's a story of three, of three people who were given paradise on Earth. They were given a second chance at life. They had all had tough lives, yeah. no question. Jerry had been a hooker and she was a hustler. Lefty had been arrested a dozen times. He was an ex-bookmaker. He had a lot of cops chasing him until he could get to Vegas and be legit. Tony had homicide things pending over his head. They all got to Vegas. And Las Vegas, the people from that world, is like a morality car wash. It's a city with no memory. You go to Las Vegas and you are purified. There is no, there are no cabots and lodges and uh, uh, there's no social hierarchy there that looks down its nose at anyone. If you go there and you start to live a clean life and succeed in the business, you are then part of the hierarchy of Las Vegas. And this was an opportunity given to these three people. And in a way, I wanted the story to show how they got there. And once they were there with paradise in their hands, how human nature caused them to destroy their own paradise. And that human nature was what? Who they were to begin with. They could not in the end. Not stop. They could not change. The instincts that they That's had. right. It's the, it's the frog and the scorpion. You know the frog and the yeah. scorpion. Yeah, the story about Vietnam. You know, why, why did you do it? Because this is Vietnam. Yes. Because they're crossing the river and That's sink right. to the bottom. That's right. It was in their nature. And you can't. I mean, that it's tragic. That's the, moral, that's that's the, tragic. the morality story that's yeah, here. Yeah, that's, that's the tragedy of it. That's sort of the if you want to put these people on a level where you want to even give them tra tragic proportions. I do. I think that's a, it's a fascinating thing. You know, these people have been through hell to begin with. They get to Vegas they get in the, the late second 60s, chance, they get and they the get the second, second chance and blow it in the parade. And they blow it. And one dies, of, you know, one dies of an overdose, and the other is beaten to death in a field. Yes, yes. And and Frank basically lost paradise because he. He, um, I think, uh, was too obsessed with his own power and, and wasn't willing to bend a little bit. Yeah. You shot this in Vegas? Yes. At shot. the Riviera Hotel? That's right, it was. Shot in the Riviera Hotel. They, uh, they closed it down? At no, the they never did. What? They weren't able to close it because, you know, you, a casino yeah, makes so much more money. money than you could yeah. ever pay them as a, as a film company. But they were very kind to us, and they did allow Marty to shoot at night. He would shoot, they'd start shooting there about midnight and wind up at 7 in the morning. It was a murderous, murderous schedule. Yeah. But the quality you get out of shooting in a real casino is so much better than the feel you get out of the, you can't the make best it up for sound, sound stage. Set. You yeah. can't do it. The, there's a quality of the paint and the rugs are worn out in the right way. You know, it's just, it's there. You say that the structure of the story came from Marty. He gave you the structure, did you? In a sense of the film. I mean, he gave the film structure. Well, what we did is we yeah. tried to figure out what the structure of the story right. was. It was, very, it was a very yeah. simple one. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's paradise lost and these people and how they lost it. What I'm he gave me, what he gave me was, was a sense of dramatic line. That's what I mean. Better it was say. a dramatic, because when you're, when you're doing a nonfiction book, you can do it in an impersonal way. You're the omniscient author. Yeah. Yeah. And then in Las Vegas in 1983, yeah. they yeah. handed, it, you know, and type, 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 type. But if you're doing a movie, you can't do that. You can't run in 83. You know, you got, it all has to happen through character. It has to happen. And understanding Rosenthal, De Niro finally went to see Rosenthal. Oh, yes. Oh, and finally, they went a lot. Went they went a lot. But yeah, they got to, to see him. Yeah. Yes. And, and they became pals. Yes. And he understood what about Rosenthal? Oh, God knows. <laughs> but he got he's famous for doing that. Well, he's a vacuum cleaner. I mean, he is the world's greatest. He just, he, and he is, he's sensitive and aware all of the emotional touchy things about these characters and and uh, he and uh, Rosenthal got to be very friendly and they they uh, and it's interesting that they should they that these two characters should have gotten that close and uh, I think uh, Bob was able to get an awful lot of very very good stuff from Rosenthal this book is Casino Lie, Love and Honor in Las Vegas Nicholas Pileggi, who, as you know, wrote Wise Guys. The movie will be opening very soon. Right? Yes. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see the movie and see what happens when they come out simultaneously. It'll be uh, interesting. Great to have you here.
good to be here, John.